Um, all right, so we're, we're good to go. Um, thank you all for stopping by today. Um, it's our esteemed pleasure to welcome Ava Roy to, to Google as part of the Talks at Google program. Um, she's the founding director of something called We Players, which had its origins at Stanford University and is now a prominent fixture in, in life in the Bay Area. Essentially, it takes the, the ideas from Shakespeare of making all the world a stage and um, you know, making, delivering truth on that and putting it into practice. They do site-specific performances and installations throughout the Bay Area, anything from the uh, the story of the Odyssey on Angel Island to Hamlet on Alcatraz to most recently Macbeth being performed on Fort Point. And so Ava will go ahead and tell us a little bit of the background behind the um, the productions, you know, and what it truly means and the effect it has on you know art in the Bay Area. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ava to Google. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for having me, you guys. So um, I'm pretty. I'm happy to. Uh, well, I'm here to give you a little bit of information about We Players and, and tell you about what I do and, and give you some examples of the work. But really open to a conversation. So if you guys have questions or particular areas of interest, as I'm rattling on, please feel free to chime in or ask any questions. And there's a lot that I can talk about. This is my, my life's work, so there's lots um, of, of angles and directions. So if there's an area of particular interest or question, please chime in and, uh, and we'll kind of pursue that avenue of things. Um, but to start us off, basically, We Players is, um, as Cliff just mentioned, a performing arts company, and we're dedicated to site-integrated performance. And I've actually sort of shifted from calling it site-specific to site-integrated, because I realize that as site-specific is becoming an increasingly popular way of, uh, or term, uh, and way of staging things, that what I've realized, that's one of the things that's really unique about the ways that We Players create work is that it's really embedded in a very particular site. So it's not, each show is non-transferable to any other site. It's very carefully crafted and built into the physical environment with awareness of the um, sort of historical and cultural and environmental energies and factors of that, of that space. And I'll give you some examples to kind of make that make a little bit more sense. Um, but basically, we're, we're committed and dedicated to transforming public spaces into realms of participatory theater. So that means that nowhere is safe and that everywhere I go is a potential stage, a potential performance environment. So I'm, uh, hmm, your <laughs> campus is pretty interesting. But um, uh, one of the things that's been really special over the past five years is that I started partnering with the National Park Service in 2008. And since then, I've been able to develop this really remarkable relationship with the National Park Service. Um, and we've performed on Alcatraz Island. I was the first theater and artist in resident on Alcatraz from 2009 to 2011. I've been at Fort Point, which is the Civil War fortress under the Golden Gate Bridge. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. We have a show there right now. Um, as well as a five-year cooperative agreement with San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park, which is if you brave Fisherman's Wharf and get through that, uh, right after Fisherman's Wharf and kind of before Ghirardelli Square, right in that area is Hyde Street Pier, and there's these incredible old historic ships, uh, and we perform on their ships, sometimes while sailing around the bay and sometimes while they're docked. In addition, we've started partnering with the California State Parks as well, and as Cliff mentioned, we've done a show out on Angel Island. So um, basically, some of the main hallmarks of the work are that as an audience member, you're also a participant. And I'm not interested in kind of doing a bunch of crazy things to get a rise out of people. I'm the first person, if I go to a show and they're like, can we have a volunteer? It's like, I'm going to just hide. Um, so it's not that kind of participation. It's, it's intended to uh, create conditions for certain kinds of experience so that you sort of drop into this world of the play. And the idea is to kind of create a sphere of performance so that nothing is outside of this world of the play. And so that just by being there, you are immersed quite, quite physically into this world of the play and that you find yourself participating kind of without having to make a conscious choice about it necessarily. Now, the most basic level of participation that is required is that you have to be on your feet and you have to physically move to follow the show because every scene happens in a different location and how, this, how the show moves in the space is prescribed by the space. So if it's a huge island, we're moving all around the island, up and down levels and in and out of buildings and outdoor spaces. At the fortress right now, you're not covering as much mileage as you would be on Alcatraz or Angel Island. Island, but you're going up and down these steep stairways, stone corridors, the four, uh, four stories of the fortress itself. So you're physically on your feet and you're moving to follow the show as it moves. Now within that, you actually get to choose and change your perspective from which you view the show. 
And this is where that more personal level of participation and choice and perspective starts to really drop in. Because you can choose to get really close to an actor and be you know, really, really right next to them. Or you can kind of draw back and kind of get a bigger picture. If you are briefly distracted by a flock of birds flying overhead or by the full moon rising behind the warriors as they battle to their death on the roof or the sunset or whatever other kind of miraculous participation from nature, that's totally invited and in fact very much part of the work because while the shows are very carefully constructed and I'm very dedicated to telling the story of the play uh, as clearly uh, and as effectively as I can, part of staging things in these kind of multi-dimensional stages um, where we're able to use distance and proximity um, to our advantage is that you can't possibly catch everything by seeing it once. There's just too much going on, there's too much detail in the space and that my hope is that in kind of participating in the theatrical experience in this way, that we become a little bit more adept at paying attention to what's happening above us, behind us, below us, and this kind of thing. And that sometimes those really special things that happen, like when a shaft of sunlight comes in and lights up an actor for a moment, of course I can't get that every day. The light's changing every day. Temporality is actually a really big component of the work. But when that happens and you realize, oh my gosh, that's the sun hitting Hamlet or whatever it may be. Um, my hope is that brings us into a, a greater appreciation that this is a precious, unrepeatable moment in time, and it will never happen this way exactly again. Which if we can practice that in this kind of heightened container of the theatrical experience, we might become a little bit more facile at, at appreciating that in our day-to-day -day lives. So those are kind of some of the, the hallmarks of the work, and uh, I'll talk more about it as we go. But to give you some examples, I'm starting here with what is uh, easily recognizable as, uh, as Hamlet, although it is played by a woman in this um, case, but uh, there's poor Yorick. And so Hamlet was a production on Alcatraz Island, which is the entire island. So the audience, the show starts on the boat, uh, on the ferry as you're riding over, um, and as you can see, the audience is physically right there next to Hamlet, and they're following Hamlet as he's moving around the island. Um, in this situation, the audience is following Hamlet up a steep incline, and Hamlet is chasing his father's ghost. And uh, this is a representation of the ghost. So one of the things I was able to do with this production is actually, through this costume choice, have six different actors dressed in this way. And so we were literally able to create that effect of the ghost appearing and disappearing. Now on the top of the guard tower, you know, 100 feet above your head, now on top of the cell house, now in a window and then disappearing, so that as Hamlet's running up the stairs and seeing the ghost in all these different places, the audience is having that same experience, following Hamlet. Where's the ghost gonna appear next? So again, that's kind of one of the, the ways of, of blowing out the stage space and having that kind of really multi-dimensional experience. And this gives you a little bit of a sense of our backdrops. Our scenic designer is um, <laughs> quite remarkable. But of course, you have the, the Bay Bridge and, and San Francisco city skyline. And uh, these are some of the you know, just really precious things about working in real spaces that, of course, you can't achieve in an in indoor theater, um, actually having that, that relationship to where you've come from. You, know, you can see where you got on the boat, San Francisco, and, and where you are now. Um, that's the parade ground on Alcatraz Island. These are old rubble piles from um, what used to be um, large buildings. Hey, welcome. So again, this kind of distance and proximity thing, sometimes the actors are, are right up there with you, really close to you, and interacting directly. Um, so there's this real immediacy and, and real visceral experience with the actors. Um, and again, every, every scene is kind of specifically chosen for different places. So the show itself is chosen for the site. So Alcatraz is not a great place for, for Midsummer Night's Dream, but it's a perfect place for, for Hamlet. Um, but then within that, after we've chosen the, the show for the space, that then there's the particulars of what scene, what text, which monologues happen where, and how can the space and the story mutually enhance each other. So when Hamlet's standing there on the parade ground with the cell house behind him and talking about Denmark's a prison, and oh, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. You know, he doesn't have to gesture and gesticulate wildly to the, to the prison to kind of get what he means on a deeper level and on a more visceral level. So similarly, I'll sort of use uh, ways of positioning the audience to inform or affect how you're receiving uh, the text. So here, Hamlet's going through, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? And this is where he's feeling cabin cribbed, confined, and trying to work out how he's going to deal with 
with the king, catching the conscience of the king. So we have Hamlet behind this, this chain link fence and the audience uh, watching the scene through it. And this is actually a, a, an example of when that shaft of sunlight came and in this, on this one particular day, and it just so happened the photographer was there on that day to catch this moment, um, which again doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's, it's really precious and you suddenly realize there's a sense of wonder you know, that I think that we're trying to achieve in theater. And when nature can sort of step in and contribute to that, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable and precious, I think. Um, again, here you have a real closeness of the audience and the actors. We're in one of the, um, we're in the hospital in the cell house here. Um, and that's been one of the things as well, working with the National Park Service that's been really special, is getting access to the closed areas of the site. So when you go to Alcatraz Island, there's a lot of areas that you actually can't go into that we were able to bring our audiences into. So you get to have this really intimate relationship with the, with the space as well. And one of the things that's so precious for me is actually getting to see the audience and getting to see how, what, how it's affecting them. So they're not somewhere out in a dark you know, theater. They're actually right there. And that is both wonderful and absolutely horrible <laughs> for the actors <laughs> because you don't get to hide. Everything is really transparent. Everything is really immediate. Um, and so if the audience is totally engaged as they hear, are here with Ophelia after she's just gone through the sort of worst breakup ever, um, you can see the empathy on their faces and, the, and, they're <laughs> and they're really connected with her. Of course, if it's not going well and they're like staring off and you know, that's also revealed. So there's this kind of transparency that is kind of a curse and a blessing, um, but, but really unique um, for the actors and you get to feed off of the, the audience in a more immediate way. Yeah. How, how do you deal with the practical stuff like costume changes? You know, if everyone's following Hamlin around all the time, and he has to change clothes, where does he go? Yeah, well, the audience gets to have a pretty intimate relationship with the island, but we have an even more intimate relationship <laughs> with these spaces. We really learn a lot about all the secret kind of nooks and crannies. You would be amazed at what some of our green rooms and dressing rooms look like. I mean, sometimes they're, uh, they're decent, but sometimes they are um, little tiny, you know, corners of, of the island or a little like, you know, an old, um, gardening shed becomes a quick costume change location. So, and that's actually a big part of my process as well, is I, I spend a lot of time on the site long before the actors come. So even longer before the audience comes, really getting to know the space. Uh, and it sounds maybe a little funny, but in addition to kind of learning about the practical stuff, about where's our green room gonna be and where are the bathrooms and all of those things, it's also a lot about um, a real um, sort of intuitive um, relationship with the space. So there's a lot of times where I just go to the site and I listen and try to really listen to the site and hear what it's saying. I really believe that stones hold memories and that all the spaces we inhabit have a history and that history is, is there. And if we quiet ourselves enough and slow down enough to tune in, we might actually hear some of those echoes of the past. And that's more obvious when you go to like Greece or somewhere where there's really ancient ruins and it's it's somehow more immediate to feel that sense of that our ancestors and, and ancient uh, people have walked those stones and that's why you know the cobblestones in, in an old town um, are smooth. You can feel that those feet have walked over it. Well, that that's true even when it's a little bit harder to access in some of our, our more um, uh, localized spaces or more immediate spaces. So there's a lot of spending time in the space, checking out what does the light do at different times of day? What's the weather like? What are the natural traffic patterns? What are the birds doing? What is the time of what time of year are we going to be in the space? What phases the moon in? And letting all of those things, both on a practical level in terms of rain and wind and those kinds of concerns, as well as on an energetic level, um, uh, both work to kind of support uh, how the show works in the space. Um, and here you can see the audience kind of backing up Hamlet and, Le and Horatio as they walk to the parade ground for the final battle with the city behind them. Um, and the final view of, of the show, where you actually get a sense of, of the relationship of some of these photos I've showed you to where the, where the cell house and the lighthouse is itself. So from Alcatraz, we, we did that show in 2010. We actually had a three-year residency, so there was a couple of other projects we did out there as well. But uh, Hamlet happened in 2010. And then we went over to Hyde Street Pier. This is Alice Watts, who's the first mate of the schooner Alma. Alma's a 150-year-old scow schooner. She's the only boat um, in the SF Maritime fleet that actually still sails. And what's cool about Alma is that she's, um, it's actually from the stern of the Balclutha, which is another boat at Hyde Street Pier. Those are the actors up on the, on the stern, or what's called the poop deck of the Balclutha. She's a three-masted tall ship um, who's actually sailed around the, 
the horn 17 times, which is kind of cool in terms of that relationship to history in the past. This is before engines. This is before there was the Panama Canal. Um, so it's pretty, um, pretty amazing to step foot on that boat and feel that she uh, has this history um, and that we get to play uh, and uncover some of her stories through telling new stories. So back to Alma. Uh, this is the Cyclops eating Barbies um, on, the <laughs> on the stern of the Alma while sailing. So this show was a production of the Odyssey that took place on Alma, so she's a 60-foot floating stage. Uh, something that's cool about a scow is they're a flat bottom boat. They were the original barges. So the, these were sailing barges that would move hay and produce back and forth from the San Francisco Bay to the Delta and back and forth. Um, and so she doesn't heel. So for an audience, it's basically like a floating stage because you don't have the classic sailboat bottom, and so it, we don't heel side to side. It's like a raft with sails. So it's a really stable vessel for a show. Um, and here we are sailing past our previous stage, Alcatraz, and that's been one of the things that's been pretty, pretty cool over the past few years is now looking out on the San Francisco Bay and seeing all of these stages and all of these places that have been transformed. Um, and that's one of my favorite pieces of, of feedback from audience members is that they say, Alcatraz is now Denmark forever, you know? Uh, Angel Island is now Greece and Ithaca and, and the home of, of Odysseus' uh, trials and tribulations. So these spaces are, are transformed, and that's something so special about, about theater, right? It's this ephemeral thing. It, its birth is a death, you know? It, it, it happens and we let it go, and it evaporates. And it's this, as I was saying before, this kind of precious and unrepeatable moment that, that flies away but it can live on when it's really effective in the hearts and minds and psyches of the, of the people who experienced it. And so that's one of the things that's really rewarding well after the fact when people come and they say, you know, that these sites have been transformed. And furthermore, that we've been able to expose a lot of people to these really incredible gems of our local landscape that people didn't know about. A lot of people don't know that Hyde Street Pier exists. They don't want to go down to Fisherman's Wharf because of the, the dense tourist experience. But if you just brave it a little bit further, you find this incredible park and these incredible boats. Um, again, you can see kind of closeness to the actors, so it's really happening in front of you, around you, amongst you, and so forth, as well as above you. Here we commissioned some artists to paint giant backdrops on sails. Um, so we have this kind of 10-foot eye um, painted on a sail to help us tell the story of the Cyclops. And we also were able to send Hermes up aloft on the mast, so he's about 80 feet above your head on the top of the, the rig um, as, as the god Hermes. And then from the stern of Alma, you can look out and see Angel Island, which was our next stage. So we continued with this theme of the Odyssey um, for a couple of years and then took the Odyssey to Angel Island. So while it was first a, a show on a 60-foot floating stage, we then blew that out to um, a five-hour show that encompassed a five-mile perimeter route around an 800-acre stage, which was Angel Island. So here is Telemachus. Odysseus's son waiting at the beach in Ayala Cove as the ferry full of audience members arrive. Um, and as soon as you arrive, the part of the idea, again, as I was talking about before, of the sphere of performance is that we try to create an experience where you feel like the world exists with or without you. And so you get to participate for a time. Um, and in this case, when you arrive as audience members from the ferry, you step right into Ithaca and the suitors are playing games and jeering and drinking and partying and, and barbecuing meat, and you're sort of brought right into it and encouraged to play tug of war with them or, or eat from the barbecue or drink. And so there's this, this, this whole um, world kind of already happening that you get to step into. Again, you get a sense of, of distance as well. So we're close to Telemachus um, in this scene, but Mentor is appearing up on the hillside behind him. And even, this photo doesn't capture it, but even behind him, even farther up the hill, is Athena overlooking. So again, you get to kind of really challenge your own perspective in terms of looking both what's in the foreground as well as what's in the distance. And uh, here's the intrepid audience trekking along after, after Telemachus. And it's a long journey, and it was certainly part of the intention to send the audience on an odyssey themselves. And it would sort of crack me up when, when uh, people after the show <laughs> would say, oh, but I'm so hungry and I'm so tired. It's like, yeah, yeah, good work. <laughs> you are, you should be. It was five hours of hard work. So. Um, we went to many different worlds on Angel Island with an 800 acre stage. You can imagine that there's many different um, environments within that. So on the windward side of the island where we are now, there's lots of wind and you have the view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And so that was a good setting for Aeolia. Uh, Aeolus is the king of the wind. So this is where um, 
we went for for the king of the wind and use the wind as much as possible so using lots of fabrics and kites and things that embrace the wind in that land um, and you can see the golden gate bridge which again is a kind of incredible scenic backdrop that you don't get in an indoor space and some days there'd be regattas and there'd be sailboats going by and and uh, pretty fun stuff um, and again you can kind of see alcatraz behind Telemachus and the city behind him. So this awareness of um, just expanding our relationship to how we relate to the spaces that we inhabit and the spaces that we live in. So as we're moving around the island, um, you come as you curve around the west side of the island and start uh, heading east a little bit, you get to the old quarry. And actually this quarry, um, a lot of this, the stone that was uh, quarried there um, is at the foundation of the financial district in San Francisco and also became Mount Olympus, um, which has kind of a nice uh, metaphor, but more importantly, it's an 80 foot cliff. And that, uh, that created a really nice way to actually have that feeling of looking up at the gods and then being truly towering over you. So the gods were, were up there. You can imagine that in rehearsal, this is kind of hilarious in terms of directing because you're yelling up to your actors, okay, more, more like this, move to the left, um, hike up that hill, come back down, get notes, hike back up. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm focusing, of course, on the joys of how nature contributes. Um, often there was uh, an eagle um, that, um, not an eagle, a hawk, a red-tailed hawk that nests nearby the quarry that would often fly right over Zeus's head during the scene. And you're just, it's just an amazing thing, especially for people who know a little bit more about Greek mythology, you know Zeus's relationship to, to eagles and, and birds of prey. Um, some of the not so awesome things that happen sometimes when nature contributes is there was also um, a family of geese that decided to nest on the hillside. Um, and that became really borderline for a while there because if those eggs um, were to hatch, we would not be able to use Mount Olympus as Mount Olympus and there was obviously no other choice for that. So, you know, um, while it's fun to focus on all of the really positive th ways that nature contributes and for the most part, um, that's my experience, there's certainly some things when a helicopter goes overhead at exactly the wrong moment and you're in this, you know, really deep <laughs> soliloquy and you either have to wait for it or shout over it. Um, but in any medium, you know, whether it's art or otherwise, there's constraints and affordances and you work within that. Um, so for me, a lot of the, the affordances and blessings of the environment far outweigh the constraints, even though um, you know, there were a lot of ticks at the bottom of Mount Olympus <laughs> and things like that. That's not so great. So after rehearsal in Mount Olympus, you know, everyone's doing their tick check. Um, so it's, it's pretty unique kind of actor as well for whom uh, this is a good fit um, because it's certainly very demanding physically. Um, there's a lot of old batteries on Angel Island. Angel Island actually has um, 130 years of military history, which is kind of a um, rather unknown. A lot of people focus on the immigration story on Angel Island, which is a really important part of the island's history, but there's also a huge and long-standing military history. Um, and so there's these old batteries from World War I and World War II. This was the Cyclops Cave, and the audience was locked inside this dark, um, this dark cave and needed to um, escape. And actually, when you step outside, I don't have a photo of this here, but when you step outside, there was actually, we felled a eucalyptus tree, um, which are non-native, and so they're trying to thin them out on Angel Island anyway. Um, so we played our part. But there's, um, a, we felled the eucalyptus tree and, and shaved the, the end of it down to a spike and it's covered in blood. So when you actually step out of the Cyclops cave, if you know the story, you realize that this is the stake that Odysseus has used to cut, to, um, to poke out the Cyclops' eye. Um, and something that's cool is if you don't get the story, you're not left out. What actually happens is that when you're walking from site to site, you start to overhear, and I'm often sort of incognito in the audience tuning in to this, and you start to overhear people talking to each other and people explaining it. And one of the most remarkable things is that little kids are some of the best interpreters because they're totally able to engage. They're not sitting in a seat. Well, none of us are, but we're you know, moving and, and moving around. So the, the kids really get to run and follow the actors and get up really close. And because of the, the Percy Jackson and the lightning thief phenomenon, they know the Odyssey really well. So it was amazing to be walking on the, on the trail between scenes and hear people talking to each other and asking each other questions, audience members who maybe didn't come together, maybe didn't know each other, and then little kids chiming in and giving more more information about, no, 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 that was Circe and that's Calypso. Um, so that's, that's pretty special that parents get to bring their kids and it's not a kid's show, but both get to really experience it in a, in a full way. Um, 
There's also some audience participation. I focused on just the, the moving and following the shows. There's some situations where you can choose your perspective, you can choose your path, and you can only choose one, like in life. So here we meet at the crossroads, and Zeus meets you there and says you can go one of three directions. You can go to the island of Temenos, uh, where sacred beauties will anoint you and sing to you and soothing what, and that was secretly the best way to go. But um, most people felt like they needed to prove their mettle in the obstacle course, which was held on the Nike missile launching site. So that's a Cold War site um, uh, with subterranean missile silos. Um, and we transformed that into the, the land of Scylla and Charybdis, two of the most fearsome, loathsome uh, creatures known to mortals. And the third option was to climb up a hill, uh, hike up a, a little hill, and cheer on the hero of your choice. So here Zeus gives you that choice, and you can either run, literally run, to the obstacle course, you can hike up the hill and watch it, or you can follow the bard, uh, Phemius, who will uh, uh, sing to you as you go to the chapel. So you have these options. Um, here's Zeus up on the hill with those who chose to watch the, um, the obstacle course, um, and these are um, tentacles of Scylla coming up from the silos, and the audience braving their way through. Um, at some points you meet Hermes on the path. He often is on various golden things, golden scooters, golden bicycles, golden transport. Um, this is the island of Temenos. And I want to pause here just briefly because while only less than a third of the overall audience has actually got to see this scene, um, this, this location was a place that um, some things happened that really reminded me and gave me so much fuel and juice for why uh, why put in all the work to do this? Um, I'm really interested in ritual, and that performance is born out of ritual. Um, the, first, the first storytellers, we were gathering around fires and telling stories, and so I'm really interested in what ritual can teach us to make our modern day performances more than entertainment and something really sacred and really special, or at least create the possibility for that. And this, that, that happened on a number of occasions where there, was no scene, there were no words in the scene. There were three women dressed all in white in an old chapel, in a World War II era chapel. Um, and they were singing beautiful harmonies. And you came in and they just sang. They didn't speak. But you would walk in and every traveler, every weary traveler they'd bring in, you were like three hours into this five hour ride at this point. So you are tired and hot. And they bring you in and they wash your hands with eucalyptus scented water. And they walk around and they dip flowers in cold water and, and touch it to your forehead. And really, really simple gestures that have no religious connotation. But I saw so many people walk up and receive it as if they were receiving communion. I mean, actually bow to these women with tears in their eyes. And when the women would come around with these little flowers, they were like flowers to the light, like, to, don't forget me, don't forget me. Um, and for me, that was a really precious reminder of what can, what can happen, that there was a kind of spiritual energy and a kind of real communion with the actors um, and with the environment and with what happened. And this, again, was without any words and without any um, telling you how to feel and without, again, any, any religious connotation. But some really special energy was, was shared in that space. So it reminded me that that's, uh, in addition to it being really grand and glorious and fun, that it can also be really sublime as well. Um, you travel to Circe's house. I'll move fairly quickly through these. We went to the House of the Dead, um, which is a stage in an old um, hospital, uh, kind of burned out skeleton of a building. Um, the dead emerge on four floors above your, above your heads. We go down to a beach where Calypso is and wants to keep you forever. And Hermes appears on his latest golden ride, his golden speedboat. Um, so again, this is one of those things, you know, you're four and a half hours in, and your back is to the water, and you're facing Calypso, and you think, this is pretty nice, all these beautiful women who just want to, like, massage my hands and take care of me forever. And the next thing you know, from behind you, you hear this sound of trumpets, and you turn around, and there's Hermes and his, and his entourage. Um, so besides using, you know, uh, levels, in this case, we also got to use the water in the distance behind you. Here's Hermes, showing off that Hermes. And uh, we, leave, we leave Angel Island and we move to Hyde Street Pier. Um, this is Hyde Street Pier, which I've talked a little bit about already. This is a hysterical shipwrecked woman in a rowboat. Um, so this is Twelfth Night, which starts out with a shipwreck. And so the audience actually met on the beach and didn't really know what was going to happen until they started hear, hearing these wailing sobs of a woman on a, on a rowboat who then jumps out of the water and, and runs up onto the beach. Um, and we actually got a lot of people who would call in and say, you know, there's a hysterical woman on the beach, what's going on? And, and luckily all of our park partners were able to pretty quickly translate that, no, it's okay. Um, 
And then from there, the show, the show moves uh, down the pier, and we use all of the different boats in this case. Um, so you can see the audience close to the actors on the pier. Um, this, the audience is actually on the other side of the pier watching from a boat. So we're just trying to use as much of the full and total environment as possible. Again, proximity with the, with the audience. It's pretty fun to get these, these moments of people's appreciation. This woman's feeling pretty tickled about being right next to that actor. And of course, Malvolio. If we have time later, I'll show you some video of this show. But, um, uh, but I'd like to move on just so that I can tell you a little bit about Macbeth, which is the current show. So um, we're th three weeks into the run. We have three weeks left, Thursday through Sunday, Macbeth at Fort Point, and this is the fortress. So when you step inside, this is, this is an, uh, a sense of what it's like inside with the Golden Gate Bridge soaring overhead and the three sisters working their charms on the heath. And um, one of the things that's really amazing at Fort Point, and there are so many things, is that the and in fact, in all of these shows, that the natural sonic landscape really informs your experience. So here at Fort Point, you have the crashing of the waves up against the fortress walls, which is sort of mirrored by the sound of the rumbling traffic over your head. And on foggy days, every five seconds or so, you get this deep, low bass note of the foghorn. So we, our music director is really trying to incorporate uh, these sounds into and embrace what's already there, right? So we're not trying to, to push that away. We're saying, yes, this is what's this is what the space is like, this is why it's perfect for Macbeth, and how can we um, have our work kind of um, merge with that rather than push against it. Um, the fortress, um, this is kind of within the interior space, so sometimes you're on the open heath in the middle, sometimes you're moving in and out of these kind of dark uh, corridors and so forth. Um, and it's pretty incredible as you're walking around. I mean, at first you're just like, okay, seven million bricks. And then you get in close and you realize there are vibrant lichens of all different colors growing on the walls. And there's all these patinas that you would spend a lifetime in a stage shop creating um, that are just natural because it's so old. Um, again, it gives you a little sense of the scale of the space. And as an audience, you're moving up and down all the levels of the space. The three sisters are kind of uh, omnipresent in a way. They also act as the servants, and so they can be anywhere and everywhere. So they're sort of watching and observing, and uh, they are the ways that the walls have ears. So they're gathering all of this information throughout the, throughout the show. Um, there's poor dead Banquo. Um, and here as well, there's some, some op there you have two, there's two different groups. Sometimes you're moving all as one group, Sometimes you're splitting into multiple groups and seeing things in a different order. Sometimes you're seeing things from different vantage points. So every site kind of has its own way of informing how we move through it. With Angel Island, it was fairly you know, processional, one route all the way around. Um, with other sites like Fort Point, um, because some of the ar areas are so confined and narrow and you can only fit so many people in them, we'll break you up and have you see things in different, in different order or different vantages. Um, and sometimes you actually get to go indoors, which is a rare treat, um, and uh, encounter strange and sort of inverted domestic tasks that the witches are up to. Uh, again, just another uh, sense of the scale of the space. Interior space and the poor dead Macduffs. Um, and then one of the things that's really fun about this show um, I don't know if fun is the right word for Macbeth, but that we start in the daylight and that as the play descends into deeper and deeper darkness of psyche and soul, the light descends as well. And I mentioned very briefly earlier about temporality and how season and time plays a big role in this. So that's the durational experience of like the Odyssey, being on a five hour ride and feeling higher, tired and hungry and getting cranky at some point and then getting your second wind and, and that aspect of temporality, but certainly also relationship to, the, to natural daylight and the change of light and how that can work with the, the show. Um, and here you have the audience participating as Burnham Woods storming the castle. Hi. So those are, um, that gives you just a little bit of a, a sense of some of the ways that we use space. Um, and again, that every single site um, has its own constraints and affordances and stories and energies and um, can really inform how we use the space, how we move through it um, as much as possible, trying to have the sound and the costumes all really feel like they belong to the space and they come from the space rather than something we're, we're bringing onto it. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about the evolution of this entire concept from a personal standpoint? Sure, yeah. How did you come to do this? With murder Mystery Theater? Was, <laughs> um, you know. No, I went to Stanford. That's how it happened. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, yeah, so I went to Stanford, and I grew up in a very small town in western Massachusetts. But that small town has a, has a company called Shakespeare and Company. So I grew up studying Shakespeare and performing in lots of Shakespeare shows since I was like 12 or 13. So I had a real um, passion for, and, and, uh, for Shakespeare. But then when I got to Stanford, I had never visited the campus. And honestly, I just felt at a loss. I felt like I was on this really, really beautiful country club that I didn't know how to relate to. And, um, and so honestly, starting this company was a way of building a personal relationship with that space. When I shifted from feeling like I didn't belong to, oh, this is my playground. And what happens if I tie banners to the clock tower and you know, have people use these incredible stairways and sculptures as the backdrop? So the shift for me, and that's been a shift that started there that's been fundamental in the way that I see the world, is what happens if we invite ourselves to be citizens of the world? and that everywhere we go, we allow ourselves to say, how do I have a relationship to this environment? What does that mean for me? And so it really started as a very personal practice of wanting to marry my, my passion for Shakespeare um, with finding a way to kind of uh, belong to the space. And then I found that as I started to do that, it became very much an experiment, a social experiment of what would people do? If, if Romeo and Juliet are getting married in the middle of the quad and you have to either walk through it or avoid it to get to class, what would people do? And so asking that as a question has just immediately, I mean, immediately provided so many amazing uh, uh, encounters uh, and moments of beauty and surprise where people would drop what they were doing and join the parade because it was so precious and so unique. Um, and so I feel like that really inspired me to just keep asking these questions and keep asking, what if? What's right outside of our imagine, which is right around the corner of our imagination? What might happen here? What has happened here? What could happen here? So it's very much a, uh, an open-ended question and a way of, of relating to space. And, and again, doing these shows um, throughout the Bay Area, it's a big part of my mission to try to get people to connect with these gems of our local landscape, of places that we, we drive over the Golden Gate Bridge or we, we pass by, we pass through, rather than pausing in for a time and actually kind of checking it out and, and being with it. So I think we can kind of uh, practice that uh, all the time. Yeah. How do you yeah. deal with the acoustics of the spaces that you live? How do I deal with the acoustics? The acoustics are really challenging. Um, one thing is uh, working with actors who are really practiced at breathing from their bellies. So um, in life, this is useful as well. When you speak from your throat, you tend to blow your voice out. Um, and when you speak from a deep supported um, belly breath, uh, you can project much further. So part of it's training and chops and experience. Um, and part of it is just straight up challenging. I mean, when you come to Fort Point, it's likely that you won't catch every single word because when the wind comes up and is fierce, you have to be aware as an actor of where the wind is coming from and let the wind carry your voice in the right direction rather than the opposite direction. But as I was mentioning earlier, you know, it is one of the constraints of the spaces. Um, of, of working in this way um, is that sound can really be an issue. But I'm so interested in the living word and the living body that I really try to avoid technology as much as possible. Um, we use it when we need to and when it will support um, and make possible. So at Fort Point we're using lights because the show happens at night um, and, and it's great to embrace that. But as much as possible I want to work with natural elements um, including um, uh, the natural uh, instrument of the voice. But it's challenging, for sure. Yeah. Do you start with the show or this location? That's, that's a really good question. And um, it's a difficult one to answer um, because, some, because it's both, I guess. It's sometimes I have a long list of shows I'm interested in. And then as I'm just you know, exploring and scouting, sites will um, emerge that seem like a really good fit. And sometimes that first hit is like, boom, this is it. Hamlet and Alcatraz, done. Like, there's no other choice. you know. Um, and sometimes it's like, well, OK, that seems like a good lead. But let me sniff it out for a while and spend some time in that space and read the story while I'm in the space and ask more questions and do some research and see if it's really a good fit. Sometimes I get that initial hit. 
and then I go and look at half a dozen other spaces to come, only to come back to the first one. Um, and a lot of times I go to a space, and it's the space that informs the story. Um, I go in and I investigate the site, and then through that being in the place and listening to the place and doing some research, the, the story will emerge. So it's kind of a, a dance, and it's a little different with every, with every location. Yeah. Yeah. How much of the audience knows what they're getting into? You, um, that's a good question too. How much of the audience knows? Well, you get a fairly lengthy um, confirmation email when you reserve for Wii players <laughs> because it's kind of like this is how you need to prepare for your journey. Really, really. So when you come to the Odyssey and Angel Island, it's like bring water, bring snacks, wear closed-toed shoes, bring sunscreen, wear hats, and we mean it. Um, whereas Fort Point, forget all that stuff. You need your winter parkas, you need hats, scarves, gloves, and maybe a flask of whiskey. Um, no, don't say I said that. Um, <laughs> so there's lots of different ways of, of preparing. So you do get a fairly lengthy email. It's still amazing to me, even though we have it on the website and we send an email and we send a reminder and at the reservation we say, you have something warmer? Because that's, that's, that's a cute dress, but I think you're really going to want a, a warmer layer. Um, but there's still people who show up in the wrong gear and they learn pretty quickly. Um, uh, but we do really try to help the audience prepare. That said, um, it's also an acquired skill coming to a Wii Players performance. You can really tell the veteran audiences from the, the new people because they know that when, we, when they hear the music, music is huge in moving the audience. The Pied Piper phenomenon is a real thing. People will move without instruction to wherever the sound is coming from or where the musicians are, are moving. Um, and so veteran we players, audience members, hear that music and they're, they're moving, they're there. They know that you can get up right up close and kneel down and be really close to the actors where other people kind of take a little time to figure out what's okay. Um, and it's really great because we've been doing this for long enough that we always have some of those more seasoned audience members in the crowd who really help create um, the, the culture and, and the vibe of the, of the audience. And that's something that, you know, I was talking before about how for the actors, it's totally transparent, this relationship for, to the audience. But that's something pretty unique about the audience as well, is that you're next to each other. You're not, you know, pretending the person next to you isn't there. Um, you're negotiating with each other. So in a way, it is kind of this, um, this heightened sort of version of, of being in the world, where you have to negotiate with the people around you. If someone's taller than you and they're in front of you, how do you deal? Do you, are you proactive and you get in front of them and kneel down? Do you, do you reposition yourself? So there's these kind of like little interesting uh, social questions and experiments that are happening within dropping into this world of the, of the play and, and following the story. So I think um, one final question before yeah. we, we head off. Um, so you use a lot of the same cast. There's a lot of veterans that come through, and, and you, um, you don the actor's mantle from time to time as well. So how do you approach that in terms of like recruiting people and you know, training folks to, um, to your style of theater? And what's it like to perform in your own shows? Um, yeah, well, it's... Um it's really uh, been interesting the past, when I started this, you know, I was um, 18, 19. And so I was directing and producing and stage managing and making all the clothes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, and so over time, um, as things have evolved, um, I've obviously, like most growing, uh, you know, startups, have uh, tried to delegate and share and um, step out of some of those roles so that I can do the things that I am doing uh, more fully. So to that end, I've sort of stepped away from being in the shows until recently, where one of my um, actually oldest teachers, who I've known since I was like 11, has become a really close collaborator of mine. Um, and so when I have a co-director or an assistant director who I can really trust, then I feel like I can be in the show. So I actually play Lady Macbeth in the, in the current production, um, and that's thanks to having a co-director who's really uh, incredible and who I work well with and so it's been really a treat to be able to kind of stretch my acting muscles again um, thanks to having an outside eye that I can that I can trust um, as far as the actors um, there are kind of repeat offenders people who I've worked with for a few years and, and continue to work with I'm I, I audition every year so you know I'm always looking for new people um, and um, I tend to um, my auditions are like a three or four hour workshop experience. So that alone helps to sift out the people who are the right fit because you don't get to come in and do a five minute 
monologue and go away. Um, you have to really commit to being there for some time. Um, and for me, that's both a way of getting to know not just how well do you audition, you know, but how are you? How do you play? How do you listen? How do you work? Because that's what we're really getting into is months of working together, you know, and that's really important. Um, and vice versa, I feel like it's important for actors not to just have the director kind of being, you know, all knowing, standing behind the table judging you, but actually, you know, how do I work? Do you vibe with how I work? Does this, is this going to be a mutually beneficial collaboration? So that's a big part of how uh, the audition process and a longer, more durational audition process for me helps sift out people who are a good fit for. Uh, for this type of work, and also um, holding auditions for specific shows in the site they're going to be in. Because if you can't get to Angel Island for an audition, it's probably not going to work out great for you to be there every weekend for six months or something like that. So for some people that I've found that I've been working with, they really are so invigorated by being in these spaces and being outdoors, and it's just not for everybody. And that's that's great. You know, it's better to know that and say, no, I'd rather actually have be in an indoor space with a more controlled environment. Um, so part of it is having really honest communication with the people I'm working with, auditioning in the space, doing more durational, physically intensive work because there is kind of like an actor athlete thing going on where you have to, you know, hike and climb and um, and be excited and turned on by that, not just willing to kind of survive it. And I find that for people who are really into it. The elemental forces actually become a source of incredible power. So when we first started working at Fort Point, it's easy to feel really overwhelmed by how windy and how cold it is. And for some people, there starts to be a shift of like, actually, I'm going to use this wind and this cold to empower me rather than feel totally overwhelmed by it. So um, asking those questions and paying attention to how people respond to the space is, um, is a big part of selecting the, the tribe. Equity. For the most part, yeah. It's actually a very difficult um, thing because with equity rules, um, the rules aren't made for this type of theater. You know, <laughs> so in equity, it's like you can't carry your own props. It's like, well, but if you have to go two miles to get to your next scene, you might need to carry your. So it's an interesting uh, conundrum for sure. All right. Yeah. Well, Ava, thank you very much for speaking with us today, and we look forward to more amazing shows in the Bay Area. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me.